in today. Thanks, Kate. That was an awesome session. Um, so just want to welcome everyone. For those of you who are joining newly, welcome. For those of you who are, have stayed on from the previous panel, um, welcome to our session. Um, as Kate said, we're here to do Russia, a key assumptions check. And basically in the next 30 minutes, um, my, the group of speakers that we have lined up, we're going to take on head on uh, the widely held assumption that Russia is a declining power. Uh, so if we can bring up our slide and the rest of the crew and we'll get started. So basically our starting point um, is that we can see we've observed uh, that there uh, is this very pervasive assumption that Russia is a declining power. It's gained significant traction with policymakers and academics alike. And you can see some of that um, from some of the quotes that we've got up on this slide. Um, it's a very, A, it's pervasive, and B, it's been around for a really long time. So, for example, you'll see up here a quote from 2014 from then President Barack Obama, who described Russia as a quote-unquote regional power. Um, that same year, uh, the late Senator John McCain described Russia on the Senate floor as a gas station masquerading as a country. Um, you even have kind of British historian back in 2011 saying that Vladimir Putin's uh, Russia is in decline and on its way to global irrelevance. Um, and I, you know, so really the reality is, is that this assumption has been around really since the end of the Cold War. Um, the West has continuously thought about Russia as a declining power. Um, and yet here we are, uh, we're still here in a situation where Russia has sustained its capacity for uh, confrontation and disruption. Uh, it has demonstrated that it has the political will to use the tools that it has at its disposal, and it remains one of Washington's primary adversaries. So what we want to do, again, in the next 30 minutes is basically to use this session um, to examine this very fundamental assumption that Russia is a declining power. And we're going to do that by tackling four kind of sub assumptions or kind of uh, four more narrowly scoped, more um, specific assumptions that underpin that broader assumption about Russia as a declining power. So we're gonna look uh, at the commonly held views about Russia's economy. We're gonna talk about Russia's technological capa capabilities. We're gonna look at beliefs about Russia's projected military power. And finally, we're gonna talk about Russian leadership. So we have a really fantastic lineup of speakers. Um, we're gonna start with Eddie Fishman on Russia's economy. We've got Rita Kanaev on projections about Russia's uh, technological capacity. We've got Mike Kaufman, who's gonna to talk to us about Russian military power. And then at the very end, you're gonna hear from me again uh, on Russian leadership. And again, so we're gonna walk you through each of these four kind of sub assumptions that people make um, that support that larger assumption about Russia being a declining power. Um, I wanna make very good use um, of the next 30 minutes. So rather than doing introductions of each of our panelists, you can find their bios on the CNAS conference website, either on our speaker page or on our session page. And I think one of my colleagues will drop in a link to where you can find each of their bios. So welcome everyone. Welcome Eddie and Rita and Mike. It's great to have you here. Okay, so to kick things off, um, we're actually gonna turn to the audience first. Um, and we want to hear all of your assessments about Russia's trajectory, and we're gonna look out over the next seven to 10 years. And so what I want all of our audience to do is to use the polling function and to respond to the prompt that you see on the slide. So we're all asking you about whether you strongly agree, whether you agree, whether you disagree, or whether you strongly disagree with the notion that Russia is a declining power. And I think for those of you, I think if you look below the video stream, you're gonna see the chat box. Basically, you just have to enter your name there to join the chat and respond to the poll. So please everyone take a minute to go ahead and respond to that poll now. Um, and while you're doing that, I just kind of want to take a second um, and just be really explicit about the goals of the session. So I want to say um, clearly that our goal isn't really to debunk the assumption, 
um, that Russia is a declining power. We're not really here to claim that Russia is some super giant that we all need to be afraid of. Um, but instead, I think what we want to do is show that things are much more nuanced than is widely believed. Um, you know, some assumptions about Russia simply don't stand up to the current evidence. Um, and in some cases we do. And so we basically want to be able to have that conversation. I think all of us think that the United States has to have this more nuanced, clear eyed discussion about the challenges that Russia actually posed to the United States. Um, because it's important for policymakers, I think, to right size Russia in our national security priorities, right? We don't want to overstate the threats and the risks and the challenges that Russia pose because that takes up valuable time at high levels of our policy process. It takes up resources, but nor do we want to underestimate the challenge. Um, we don't want, and nor do we want to kind of be caught in a mindset where this uh, where Russia's cap capacity and capabilities are declining, that it's simply something that we can overlook or wait Russia out. So the goal of this is really just to have that more nuanced discussion so that we can right size um, our, our thinking about Russia and then the policy responses that we develop to, to confront and, and compete with Russia. All right, so with that, um, let's wrap up our polling and we're gonna get started with each of our speakers and we're gonna kick things off with Eddie Fishman um, and he's talking about Russia's economy and Eddie is gonna be taking on the assumption. So if we turn, there we go, we've got it up. Okay, so Eddie's taking on, and this is the assumption, Russia's economy will remain stagnant and sanctions will limit prospects for growth. So over to you, Eddie, to kind of give your assessment and your analysis. Well, thank you, Andrea. Um, you know, it has become common, I think, in recent years to think of Russia's economy as a basket case, plagued by policy mismanagement and stunted by exogenous factors, such as a global shift away from fossil fuels and persistent international sanctions. And these assumptions are important because they underpin this, this assumption that Russia is a declining power, as well as contentions that Russia is not a great power at all. But I think they're ultimately misleading a caricature that exaggerates Russia's weaknesses and underpins and undermines its strengths. First, let's probe whether Russia's economy is actually mismanaged. I think in many ways it is. Um, you know, Russia's economy is rife with corruption, cronyism, and dominated by politically connected state-owned enterprises. But from the perspective of fiscal and monetary policy, Russia has actually done a good job in recent years getting its house in order. After 2014, um, when Russia um, uh, sanctions were put in place following the invasion of Ukraine, Russia's economy tumbled, um, also oil prices collapsed. But Russia responded by reining in budgets and really with a disciplined fiscal policy that led to years of budget surpluses. And today, Russia actually sits in a good position. $185 billion are in the National Wealth Fund and hard currency re reserves hover near $600 billion. And this war chest has really allowed Russia to buoy its economy throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Russia also responded in 2014 with an import substitution policy that hurt Russian consumers, but has led to a booming agricultural sector domestically that now accounts for nearly $30 billion of exports every year. Finally, Russia also pivoted its economy to Asia, and this has been quite successful. Um, since 2014, um, the share of Russian trade that is uh, made up in bilateral trade with China has doubled. It's now over $100 million and is projected to eclipse $200 billion by 2025. So I think it's important to note, Russia's economy has not been kind to everyday Russians. Uh, you know, uh, I believe that real disposable incomes have declined as much as 10% since the Crimea annexation. So it's not been a great time to be a regular everyday Russian. But I think from a macro level, Russia's actually in solid shape. And I wouldn't suspect that the economy would curtail Russia's ability to project power. Second, I wanna go back to some of these exogenous factors I mentioned, climate change and sanctions. Certainly on climate change, you know, oil and gas uh, make up 40% of Russia's budget. So a major shift away from oil and gas would not be good for Russia. Um, that said, I think it's important to note that Russia is quite resilient again, against any major shift away from oil and gas because it's one of the world's lowest cost energy producers. The Russian budget breaks even at $40 a barrel, which is uh, about half of where Saudi Arabia's budget breaks even. And if you recall last year in the Saudi-Russia oil price war, Russia is very comfortable with low oil prices. Um, and I believe Russian oil producers can be profitable at prices probably as low as $15 a barrel. So I think even if oil demand does go down, and by the way, we don't yet see that in data, um, I think Russian oil will probably be um, sold on the market until that very last barrel of oil is sold, whenever that happens. 
Finally, I want to touch on sanctions. I think this is a really important topic because it's so commonly misunderstood. Um, certainly in 2014, when US and European sanctions went into, a play, into place, the Russian economy was in real damage. Um, you know, multiple points knocked off of GDP for several years. But during the four years that Trump was in the White House, sanctions were stagnant, completely stagnant. And as a result, the Russian economy adapted and returned to growth during the Trump years. I'd also note that even from the beginning, Russia's sanctions were, by design, pretty light. Um, and this is because US and European policymakers didn't want spillovers into the global economy. Um, for comparison's sake, um, take Iran sanctions, you know, another sort of paradigmatic sanctions case. Every major Iranian oil company and bank, and even the Central Bank of Iran is under full blocking sanctions. That means they're prohibited from any dealings in US dollars or in the US financial system. By contrast, not a single major Russian state-owned enterprise, not a single major oil company, not a single major, major gas company, not a single major bank is under full blocking sanctions. Um, and I, I think that this is a really important comparison because they're not really on the same level. Um, if Iran sanctions are a 10 out of 10 in intensity, if North Korea or Venezuela sanctions maybe are an eight out of 10, the Russia sanctions are probably a two, maybe at best a three. I think the bottom line on sanctions is that they probably will cap Russia's prospects for growth. Certainly Russia, the economy would be better if there were no sanctions and foreign direct investment has suffered uh, during the period of sanctions. But I don't think they're significant enough to fundamentally curtail Russian power. And to be honest, they weren't designed to curtail, curtail Russian power. So where does this leave us? At a high level, Russia's economic prospects are not so grim as to condemn Russia to some sort of inexorable decline. But I do think there is one valuable an important lens to bring up, which is the lens of opportunity cost. Certainly, if Russia were to root out corruption and cronyism and actually impose economic policies that allowed everyday Russians to achieve their full potential, Russia could be a much greater power than it is today. Thank you and back to you, Andrea. Eddie, that was awesome. Thanks for that. So now we're gonna shift gears. Um, and again, we're flying through this in 30 minutes. We're taking on a lot, but we're shifting gears to the technology domain. And I'm gonna hand it over to Rita Kanaev, who's gonna take on this assumption that Russia is not a technological leader. So over to you, Rita. Thank you, Andrea. Indeed, you're right. There really is a common assumption that Russia is not a technological leader. And especially when it comes to discussions and conversations that we're having about innovation in emerging technologies like artificial intelligence, for instance, Russia really even factors into what seems to be a two horse race between the United States and China. And I will start by saying that to a great extent, there are some merits to this argument. There are good foundations there. Let's start with the fact that given the combined impact that the economic and demographic challenges that Russia is facing, it continues to struggle to develop, to retain, and to attract talent, specifically those highly skilled tech-savvy individuals who fuel innovation. The science and technology sector in Russia is chronically underfunded by the government, and the private sector barely plays a role in research and development in the same way that it does in the United States or in China. There's a broader societal problems like bureaucratic mismanagement, outdated regulations, and as Eddie mentioned, systemic corruption. These are all significant obstacles when it comes to technological innovation. If you look at AI, for example, into artificial intelligence, Russia lags behind the United States and China in things like hardware, data, again, talent, investment, and in outputs like research publications that are related to artificial intelligence. All of these metrics that contribute, enhance, promote innovation. Now, having said this, I'm still going to argue that this assumption that Russia is not a technological leader is not only incorrect, it's possibly irrelevant when it comes to our thinking about national security and the strategic competition writ large. So, why am I thinking this? Let's start by saying that for all of this talk that Russia is lagging behind in innovation, it still ranks among the top 10 nations in terms of its investments in research and development and its commitment to its science and technology sector. There is also very notable and promising and exciting private sector innovation in areas such as facial recognition, natural uh, language processing, speech recognition technologies, as well as robotics. 
these startups in the Russian private sector and its uh, AI ecosystems are winning international competitions and they're also winning US-led competitions, including competitions that are set up by the US Department of Defense. Which brings me to a short statement that I wanna make about innovation specifically in defense technology. Russian military modernization efforts have prioritized investments in emerging technologies in things like unmanned and autonomous vehicles. So think drones, ground vehicles, undersea vehicles that are seeing more autonomy, more AI enabled capabilities. They're progressing to, uh, mean, uh, excuse me, to promote automated command and control, automation and AI for electronic warfare. And they're also investing in machine learning tools that can increase the scope and the impact of cyber warfare and information operations. Moreover, it's important to note that about 200 next generation weapons and systems have been tested by the Russian military in combat or near combat conditions in Syria. That is something that the US military is quite reluctant to do, meaning to test new weapons in operational conditions on this appointment. And China has no experience with something like that in recent memory. So really here, when the rubber meets the road, Russia may even be ahead of the United States and China when it comes to the operational testing of new defense technologies. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, and perhaps the most compelling reason to doubt this assumption that Russia is not a technological leader, and really to ask whether it is in fact even relevant to us, is Russia's successful proven record of significant election interference across the world and hundreds if not thousands of cyber attacks that it has executed. So this is to say that Russia does not need to be a technological superpower or a technological leader even to use emerging technologies to advance its interests in ways that undermine US interests. Over to you, Andrea. Awesome, Rita, that was great. All right, so now that we've covered economy and whether or not that constrains um, military power, the technology and technological innovation. I'm going to turn it over to Mike Kaufman, who's taking on this assumption, which is that Russia's military can't keep up with the competition and its economic and demographic trajectories will constrain the Kremlin's ability to sustain its aggression. So Mike, over to you. Thanks, Andrea. I'm going to follow up my colleagues' great remarks by focusing on the military side of the equation and the demographic side. And my argument is, look, Russia is not 10 feet tall, but it's very much not four feet tall either. Its military power is objectively not declining and demographic constraints are not deterministic. In fact, they're not going to shape any of those things that we really find problematic about Russia in the future. So first, while some popular comparisons suggest Russian defense spending as being barely $60 billion per year, in reality, Russia's effective military expenditure is somewhere around 150 to $180 billion per year when we use much more accurate adjusted purchasing power parity based measures. And this, by the way, is just a conservative estimate. Naturally, Russia buys things in rubles from its own defense industry. Its defense sector is largely self-sufficient and it doesn't convert that money into dollars to buy its equipment from the United States, like Saudi Arabia might. We often use figures that misrepresent Russian defense spending, usually understating it by as much as two to three times, and often suggesting that it's even uh, smaller than the UK's defense budget. Well, you can look at the UK's military and Russian military, make an obvious assessment of which one is much larger than the other. Russia spends a much higher share on procurement and modernization. More than 30% of its military expenditure goes to that. And since 2011, it's gone through a substantial recapitalization of its conventional forces, expanding that structure, raised levels of readiness, and even engaged in a broad nuclear modernization program. So Russia has been sustainably spending more than 4% of its GDP and military expenditure through the worst of an economic recession, low oil prices, and Western sanctions. Nothing has dented it in part because the Russian state prioritizes defense over public welfare. In short, Russia spends more than several major European powers combined, gets a lot more for its money, and has been doing this all throughout the past decade when it was supposedly in decline as a power. The main constraint on Russian military is not money. It's actually defense industrial capacity to absorb the money they're trying to spend. In technology, Russia has actually closed the gap considerably in conventional capability over the past 10 years with the United States and in a number of technologies that many defense analysts think is defining for modern warfare. For example, 
hypersonic weapons, electronic warfare, directed energy weapons, offensive cyber capabilities, advanced platforms for warfare in the undersea domain, counter space systems. The list can go on and on. In all these, Russia can be thought of as either a near peer or a very significant competitor while retaining, retaining traditional advantages in nuclear weapons. So it won't supersede the U.S. in conventional capability, but definitely has enough power to deter the United States and NATO and be a sustainable challenger in the military realm. Now, if we turn to demographics, the truth is that Russia's expected population decline is much lower than some of the doomsday scenarios often offered out there in popular accounts. Median scenarios show that by 2050, Russia's population will decline by some 7 to 10 percent. So Russia is going to go from being by far the most populous country in Europe to being by far the most populous country in Europe. The outlook for Russian demographics has actually gotten much better over the past 20 years. Meanwhile, Russian manpower availability for military service is actually going to be increasing through 2033 rather than declining. In general, there's no evidence that population decline will make Russia less of a threat or constrain it meaningfully down the line in the future, especially in the areas that we care about. What matters in population ultimately is not quantity, it's quality. Although we still use many measures of power today as though we live in the 1920s as opposed to the 2020s, and we tend to focus on demographic quantity. We are not large agrarian economies with mass mobilization armies. It doesn't matter all that much for that question. Actually, the quality of Russia's population has improved substantially across most indicators. Yes, Russia lags Western countries in many demographic indicators, but it's tremendously improved the health, productivity, the lifespan, and fertility of its population over the last 20 years. And we need to think a lot harder about the relevance of demographics to state power in general. So if you think of all the things that make Russia a challenge or problematic for the United States, whether it's cyber capabilities, various forms of indirect warfare, nuclear weapons, or boutique advanced conventional military capabilities, none of them are going to decline because of Russia's problematic demographic future. And there's also nothing deterministic about the demographic future in Russia. Finally, it's important we stop assessing Russia as a declining power relative to the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union has gone. It's actually been more than 30 years now, right? We have to look at Russia in part relative to itself and relative to other countries like the United States and China. And keep in mind, what matters is not just resources, but the power to attain outcomes, the power over others in international politics. And in relative terms, Russia does not appear to be declining in global influence. So be wary of these declining sentiments because Russia has been written off time and time again in history and condemned to global irrelevance more than once, only to come back. Historically, Russia defies secular trends, and we should be cautious in these kind of proclamations. Thanks. So with that, I'll turn it over back to my colleague, Andrea. Awesome. Okay, so I'm going to back clean up and I just want to say a couple words about Russian leadership. Um, I would say I think what we've heard in our discussion is really not so much a story of Russia in decline, um, but perhaps a story about stagnation. And so then the question becomes, could Russian leadership make choices that would set Russia on a different path? And so I'm going to hit this point. And if you can bring up the final assumption, please. Um, which basically says Russia's leadership is unlikely to make the changes it needs to remain competitive. And I think this is one area where this assumption holds um, considerable merit. Um, Putin, for one, has been in power for 20 years. He has very firmly held views of the United States um, and the, the, his foreign policy thinking, I think, um, is unlikely to change. And domestically, Putin has basically built a system, um, built an economy in particular, um, that benefits a few. It's a, a system of patronage where only a few benefit where everyday Russians do not. Um, but he would be hesitant um, and very unlikely to make significant reforms that would basically undermine that system because it would threaten his very hold on power. And so for me, the you know, it, it is unlikely that under Putin, there would be any significant changes that would put Russia on a sig significantly different course. Um, but two extra points I wanted to make, because then the question becomes, well, then how long is Putin going to remain in power? And here we've been doing some new work analyzing all authoritarian regimes um, where you've had leaders in power for 20 years or longer and that look most like Putin's personalist uh, system. And when you look at those leaders um, in the post-Cold War era, 
the typical personalist or the, the typical dictator who is at least 65 years or older, which Putin is, and in power more than 20 years, if they made it to the 20 year mark, they're most likely uh, to make it to the 30 year mark. And when we narrow that down and look at the personalist leaders, so even more like the Putin system, if those leaders have made it to the 20 year mark, then the average is that they end up governing for 36 years. So that's 16 more years or 15 more years basically um, of President Putin in power. One other thing that we um, have looked at is what happens when leaders like Putin um, pursue term limit extensions. So we all know he changed the constitution. He could stay on till 2036. Uh, and when you look at all leaders, again, in the post-Cold War era, and there were 13 of them that changed term limits, um, almost all of them either went on from the moment that they changed the Constitution to govern 10 more years or they died in power. So I think that the story here is that Putin is likely to be around for some time to come, which would significantly delay um, any significant reforms or changes to Russia's current trajectory. And then the question becomes, well, what about after Putin? So sure, things can happen. And so we looked at what happens after these longtime leaders um, have ruled a country. What happens after they go? And in 76% of cases, um, and again, this is in the post-Cold War era, either the regime persists or you get a new form of authoritarianism. Um, so, and, and there is just very something that that's a very different statistic. If you look at leaders who are in power 20 years, then the chances of democratization are much higher at about 48%. So again, here, the moral of the story is where you have a leader in power this long, they've eviscerated institutions. The, the ground isn't really right for a more kind of liberal, more representative form of government to take root. And so I think the argument very much is, um, that the, that the, the type of leadership that we see in Russia today is likely to persist for some time to come. Um, again, these are baseline odds, but just to give us kind of that baseline of what to expect. Okay, so with that, we have now successfully run through all four of our sub assumptions. And what I wanna do is basically close this session um, the way that we started it, and that's with a final audience poll. Um, so you'll see here, Russia is a declining power. We're asking you all to answer this question again. Um, and we're curious to see if anyone's previous attitudes going into this session have changed at all. So please fill out the poll once again. Um, again, look under the chat, find the button that says vote. And um, we'll give everyone a second to fill that out. And while they do, I want to give our panelists the opportunity, anything that you missed, Anything that you heard your colleagues say that you want to amplify, um, anything you want to add to the conversation just while people are, are filling out the poll. Mike, so I'm, happy to, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm happy to add, add something. So I think Mike made a good point about uh, purchasing power parity. You know, you often hear, oh, Russia's economy is smaller than Italy's, right? And in terms of nominal GDP, that's true. But if you look at it from a purchasing power parity perspective, Russia is actually the sixth largest economy in the world and, and quite comparable with Germany. So um, again, I think that oftentimes some of these data and statistics are thrown out there um, you know, to undermine or undersell Russian power, but really they're just a convenient way to pretend that Russia actually isn't a great power when I think in fact it, it still is and will be for a time to come. Thank that. Great point, Eddie. And I actually, we, ha we did have a couple of questions trickle in. Um, so one, and Mike, maybe I'm going to direct this to you that talks about kind of the cost of Russia's military adventurism abroad. Is that something that has the potential to kind of drain reserves or hurt the economy? Or, you know, what, what's that relationship look like? Can they sustain this international adventurism? Yeah, absolutely. So the short answer is not really. Russia's military operations abroad are quite cheap if you look at their deployments. For example, if we look at the main expeditionary operation in Syria, that may cost as much as maybe $5 billion per year, but that's nothing to a very large power and a massive budget like Russia's. And they don't see it as a cost. They actually see this as one of the principal forms of training where everybody in Russian military has to go to get experience rank up. It's amazing, actually, if you're a country and you're not vested in nation building, right, you're not in engaging in prolonged trillion dollar uh, expeditionary operation type projects, I think actually they do it quite on the cheap. So it's not draining the Russian military and it's not draining the Russian military budget. It is sustainable and it's important for folks to appreciate this, that Russia's 
military spending and the percentage of GDP it commits to defense spending, it has gone to the worst periods in terms of recession and sanctions. It can go on and it will. Russia is a long-term military competitor and it can actually take on a larger global role if it wants to. All right, so the results are loaded. So we're gonna just do a quick before and after to kind of see how we did. So if you wanna go ahead and bring up that final slide. So we, we at least brought down the strongly agrees from seven to zero. The agrees went down a little um, and then, but we, and here we go. We did a good job on the disagree and the, uh, about the same on the um, strongly disagree, but very interesting. So I think we've moved in the right direction. And again, the point here is like to like Mike said, is not to say that Russia is 10 feet tall, um, but I think that it's just to say that we need to have this more nuanced understanding about the future challenge that Russia is gonna pose to the United States. We need to shed some of these uh, misperceptions about the nature um, of, of, of the Russia threat so that we can develop more um, effective policies uh, for navigating Russia over the long term. It's not a country that is necessarily in decline. It is much more a picture of stagnation. We can't wait Russia out. And so we need to develop policies that are gonna be effective for the long haul. So with that, in 30 minutes, I think we covered a tremendous amount of ground. It was a lot of fun. Thanks Mike and Eddie and Rita for doing it. Um, and we're looking forward to continuing this conversation. Stay tuned for future CNAS research on this topic, all with Mike and Eddie and Rita, hopefully to come. Um, and with that, I wanna turn it over to my colleague, Ilan Goldenberg. Uh, we have our next session that will start immediately here on America in the Middle East. And there's Ilan, um, and over to you. Thanks, Andrea.